Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji and welcome to the next live session of Abbott Online. And for those joining us for the first time, a special welcome. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Abbott Learning and our partners for this session. Avid Online was launched in, on April 1st, 2020, in the response to the pandemic. So now 15 months young and over 260 programs later, we can say that although 2020 and most of 2021 has challenged us in unprecedented ways, we have continued to champion to bring to you the best of the arts and culture, staying true to our mantra that learning never stops. Tracing the evolution of Bombay to Mumbai has been a passion of mine and an avid, our Multipolis Mumbai series that decoded the past while looking to the future, finding novel ways of engaging, interacting with, and re-energizing the city we love. This series was started in 2012 and we presented 46 discussions on our beloved Maximum City. In our online avatar, in February of this year, we launched a new series, Uncovering Urban Legacies, that looked at the Jewish diaspora in Bombay. Tonight, we look at the Iranian diaspora, but brace yourselves, we have planned to present a program on the Portuguese diaspora later in this year. We strongly believe in collaboration and we are proud to present tonight's session uh, with the Gateway House Indian Council on Global Relations, our knowledge partners. Uncovering Urban Legacies, the Irani Diaspora in Bombay. A live session on how this small but unique community and its rich cultural legacy have historically, economically, and socioculturally shaped the city of Bombay. Please allow me to introduce our evening speakers, archivist, oral historian and founder of Irani Chai Mumbai, Bruce Carter, owner Liberan Seafoods, Iqbal Durazi, co-owner of Davran Company, Mahavesh Rohani. And they will be in conversation with author and Bombay History Fellow at the Gateway House, Sifra Lenton. For more about our very distinguished speakers, please refer to their bios that have been pasted in the chat section. These experts will discuss the assimilation and the generous spirit of this community. They will examine how the Irani diaspora has impacted the city's restaurants and the economic and geopolitical influence. Please note the session will last 75 minutes, will be followed by a 15 minutes Q&A, in which Sifra will be taking questions from the audience. So please keep them posted in the Q&A box throughout the discussion. On that note, Thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Sifra, for your opening remarks and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Asad. Uh, welcome everyone to what promises to me to be an exciting discussion amongst our three distinguished panelists on uncovering urban legacies, the Irani diaspora in Bombay. Before I hand over to Bruce Carter, our academic on this panel and special guest from Australia, who will be making a brief presentation on the Irani cafes of Bombay and families who run it, there are a few observations I would like to make. This is just to help our audience understand how this panel has been structured and to give you a context. The discussion today is confined to 19th and early 20th century Iranian migrant communities to the city and not to the older immigrant Parsi community who also originally come from Iran. However, the Parsi community here in Mumbai have been very engaged with these later migrant communities, particularly the Irani Zarashtians. During the 19th century, Bombay's Parsi community began traveling to Iran, not just on pilgrimage and as tourists, but many also began helping their Zarashtian brethren in Iran, particularly in the Yazd province. The point I'm trying to make is that none of the Persian communities, old or new, whether in Bombay or in Iran, live in silos, a shared cultural heritage through language, cuisine, celebration of Nowruz, which is the Iranian New Year by all communities, 
and the extraordinary hospitality that all Persian communities have in common is what binds them all. Having said this, the focus is only, as I said before, on the Iranian migrants, whether Zoroastrian, Shia or Baha'i to Bombay. The second aspect I want to touch upon is the geopolitical context of those migrations to Bombay and, its, and their settlement here. Broadly, these 19th century Iranian communities in our city can be grouped according to their geographical region that they come from. The earliest were the traders and merchants from the Iranian port cities in the Persian Gulf. This merchant community, who is represented today on our panel by Iqbal Durazi, a fourth generation descendant of a well-known Bombay merchant family, hail from the Iranian ports of Bandar Bushehr and Bandar Abbas, and the cities of Shiraz, Isfahan, and Kashan, and a few also come from other markets and ports in the Persian Gulf and Middle East, like Bahrain. These merchants settled during the early 19th century in Bombay, and Iqbal will be talking about his family history in the context of this merchant diaspora, who largely traded in horses, pearls, dried fruit, and carpets. Persian carpets, in fact, were woven specially for exports, and these merchants marketed them not just in Bombay and for the India market, but from Bombay, they traded beyond to the Far East. In contrast to these maritime merchants, we have the Yazdis and the Kermanis from central and south central Iran, which include the Iranian Zoroastrian, the Irani Shia and the Irani Baha'i communities. All of them largely went into opening small tea shops, Irani cafes and juice shops known for their faluda and juices. Our panelist today, Mawash Rouhani, is a Baha'i from the Yazdi community and is the co-owner of the well-known Dawaran company, as Asad just mentioned, which has a juice shop in central Mumbai, and they also manufacture their own juices. Mawash's parents arrived here in Bombay in the pre-independence years, and she herself came to the city as a young child. She will be sharing her memories of her family and community, the Yazdis, better known as the Irani cafe owners. All the waves of Yazdi and Kermanis largely settled in Bombay and Pune, and from among those who traveled overland, some settled en route in Quetta and Karachi. It was largely after the great drought of 1870-72 and successive droughts thereafter that devastated the provinces of Yazd and Kerman that most of the men began looking east towards Bombay for work. One has to remember that these communities, whatever be their religions, were largely horticulturist. That means they were fruit farmers. Another important aspect of this legacy is that these Iranis brought here to Bombay is that of the coffee houses or the kawakhanas, later tea houses when the Iranians developed a tea drinking habit in the 19th century. These coffee houses dot the routes that connect market towns across Iran. From a macro perspective, these meandering routes that carried the artisanal works of home and cottage industries from this region to the world were dotted with these coffee houses for tra travelers, traders, and locals. These routes were once no better than mud roads and were once a part of the southern network of the old Silk Road. Bombay's earliest Irani cafe was not set up in this period, though, that is the late 19th century. According to H.D. Darukhanawala in his book, Parsi Luster on Indian Soil, the first to set up an Irani shop in Bombay was an Irani Zoroastrian named Kodadad Oshtori, who got the brainwave from his daily evening recreation of meeting his king's kinsmen on Apollo Bandar. All of them worked in these early days, early 19th century, in Parsi homes. He hit upon the idea of serving tea amongst groups of people con congregated on this promenade. He did this by modifying a Samoa so that he could carry it from group to group. 
So this is the early beginning of the Irani cafe and the Irani cafe culture in Bombay that took root at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. That is late 19th and early 20th century. It is in this broad context that one has to place the legacy and the cultural contribution of the Irani communities in Bombay. Without much ado, I would like to hand over to our academic today, Bruce Carter. Bruce? Thank you so much, Sifra. And look, thanks, folks. It's really nice to be here. Mumbai holds a special place in my heart. I have many friends there. So thanks to Abbott for inviting me. I want to start, though, by acknowledging this place where I am and acknowledging the traditional owners of the place where I live and work, the Gadigal and Wongal of the Aora Nation. And I want to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Recognising that this place is unceded Aboriginal land, always was and always will be. Okay, now I'm going to give very broad brush strokes in this presentation. Um, and it's like a series of conversations. I very much see history as a series of conversations. So we'll start with my interest and involvement with Mumbai's Iranian community started about 15 years ago. And it started here at Rashid Arani's Brabham Cafe in Dobi Talao. I've been keen on Iranian cinema since the 1980s. And at Rashid's cafe, I found people who shared my interest, none less than Rashid himself, who, while spending several decades of his life playing Gullawalla at Brabham, moonlighted as a film critic for Times of India. And so it was that on a September afternoon in 2004, I was sitting at Brabham sharing a table with a man who was probably about 70, and was literally weeping over his chai bun musca. It's as if a piece of my life is being taken away, he told me despairingly. The next day, I witnessed a film crew set up their cameras and film, night and day, life at Brabham. Within 10 days, the doors of the cafe closed for good, which I must say, in many ways, was probably good news for Rashid Arani and his brother. People's reactions, including my own, to the closing of Brabham piqued my curiosity. I wanted to find out more. What people were telling me suggested that the prospect of finding camaraderie and some thinking space over a cup of chai was central to the way Bombay's Irani cafes have been positioned in the city's popular memory. The spaces have become mythologised. For many, they symbolise the old, cosmopolitan Bombay. People over 35 agreed when I asked them that the departure of these establishments from street corners was a loss. But I wondered what the loss really represented. So I started talking to Iranis and other Mumbaikas, and on my next visit to the city, I brought with me a recorder and started interviewing people. Taking our oral histories with communities, especially minority communities in cities, was something I'd been involved with in Australia, part of the work we do that we call public history work. I chanced to meet a local historian, Deepak Rao, who handed me the 1947 Times of India Bombay Street Directory. And I identified at least 300 Iranis of cafes operating at that time. Today, as you'd know, there are perhaps a dozen in the original skin. Yet the place of the Bombay Irani and the imaginary of the city is abiding. It is remembered in novels, poetry, film and artworks. It is celebrated in its power as a heritage site monetized in commercial ventures in India and as far afield as Paris and London. Meet Danaz. I travelled to Iran. In a village some 15 minutes outside Yaz, I met this lovely couple. We drank tea, ate dates and watermelon, and we laughed for an afternoon. They were the last remaining residents of their village, which once had a population in the hundreds. As we sat chatting, I was shown a sepia studio portrait Shot in Bombay some 75 years ago was of Danaz's brother, still in his teens, standing proud with two other men, smiling and spruced in a new suit and tie. It was very hard for us here, Danaz told me. We couldn't even grow pomegranates. Many went to Bombay, many. We saw their money, but rarely we saw their faces again. So these men in the photograph took work at Kiani and later opened their own cafe. I think they ended up in the United States. Okay, a couple of days later, 300 kilometres away in Kerman, I was shown around the Zoroastrian Museum where I noticed a letter 
sent to Kudurum from Rose and Rostam Farak in Bombay. The letter assured them that their land was safe and they must continue building up their new business, Cafe Diano, just near Bombay GPO. The year was 1922. And as we all know, as an oceanic trading port and centre of commerce and industry, industry, people came from everywhere to Bombay. Some in exile seeking freedom and all, as historian Julian Tyndall has written, seeking money, seeking work and seeking life itself. Next slide, thanks, Aisha. Famine in Persia in the 1870s, uh, as was just mentioned by Sifra, was beyond devastating and it put thousands to premature death. And it was followed by plague in uh, Bombay. The situation in Persia continued to be bleak for decades and so it was that Irani Zoroastrians, aided by Bombay's Parsis, came to Bombay along with Shia and Baha'i Iranis also. There's some great work by Niall Green and also a recently published chapter by Samin Patel that has a lot more detail on this immigration for those of you who are interested. So by the 1900s, following plague, Bombay's Improvement Trust was reconfiguring the city radically. Enterprising Iranis, some of whom had started out selling tea on the street, as Sifra just mentioned, were taking full advantage of the trust redevelopment projects in South Bombay and as the suburbs developed right across the city. Premises could be leased on very favourable terms. Groups of Amirani men would get together, taking a small partnership in a model that survives to this day. Thanks, Asha. By 1927, the Irani, Times of India was telling us, was indispensable. Cafes had popped up everywhere on every second street corner. Many taking names such as Cafe Coronation, Crown, Royal, Cafe BBC, Cafe Churchill and so forth. These, of course, sat very comfortably with the British colonial project. Others, of course, took business names that drew on their Persian heritage, such as Bastani and Cafe Master. And this is where we start to see the internal design forms that we come to appreciate with the, associate with the Bombay Irani Cafe. Those marble top tables, the wood panelling, often said to be Burmese teak, the mirrors and painted glass canvases set into wooden walls. In some ways, these elements of the Irani Café speak of a similar aesthetic to cafes found in cities such as Vienna and Paris, but also places such as Alexandria, Egypt and Damascus. I have the next slide. Thanks, Aisha. Eating in an Irani Café became, in essence, an encounter with modernity. At a time when Bombay was developing into the larger-than-life metropolis, millions would start to see on film screens across the 20th century. And as these cafes grew in number, especially the smaller neighbourhood cafes, they brought into people's experience products that offered entree to what I call the Western exotic. Washing powder, bars of soap, filtered cigarettes, chewing gum, sweets and foodstuffs such as breakfast cereals were introduced to millions. And the cafe's avatar is provision store at a time well before supermarkets. And we'll see on the next slide a shot there of Rashida Rani at Brava, and you can see there that the provisions, the surf washing powder and syrups, razor blades, cigarettes, and so forth. For many women, this may have been their only contact with the Irani cafes, for these were gendered spaces for much of the 20th century, which reflected the position of women at the time, although family rooms were an accommodating space for some. The Irani cafe then became to a degree what we could call a third place. It was neither home nor work. It was a space that sits, sat between public and private, and promoted sociability and interaction beyond one's faith and social setting. The only qualifier for entry to Bombay's Iranian cafes was the ability, of course, to pay. One commentator suggested the cafes provided quintessential unassuming catering, poised between East and West. Yet, Ranjit Oskode saw much more in the corner of Irani. As depicted in Painter Sudhir Padwarden's 77 work, Irani Restaurant, these cafes were an inclusive space, a symbol of liberalism, the one bulwark against the bigotry of exclusivists. In Oskode's assessment, the public sphere made possible here is the one real guarantee of a civil society. So I spoke to Painter Sudhir Padwarden about his work and he told me, 
The interpenetration of outdoor and indoor space in these cafes always attracted me. I used to meet friends there, all sorts of people. Great political discussion we had in Irani restaurants. Now, of course, the industry is mostly gone. The residential places have grown out of proportion and the markets have gone indoors. We have those shopping malls. You would not find, he told me, in Mumbai, a cheap restaurant today where people of all classes can come and spend time comfortably like we did back then. Next slide, thanks, Asia. Back in 1934, the Indian National Congress had come to the same conclusion. And here's a page from the Congress Guide for Delegates to its meeting that year in Bombay. The guide observes that the Irani Cafe was a peculiar gift of Bombay to civilization, more than a restaurant. What strikes the visitor is not the service the place gives, but the wonderful cosmopolitanism of it. Its beaming evaluation of the corner cafe continued. The Irani has done more to break down orthodoxy, tradition, and racial and religious aloofness than any other social institution. Pat Warden's painting is an example of a cultural production around the cafes that has continued. There have been reams of newspaper articles across the last couple of decades, and mourning the Irani cafe, it seems, has almost become a genre in itself. And you can see here some examples of work uh, that is included reference to uh, the Irani cafes. And that brings me to the last 20 years and the period where I started my oral history interviews in Mumbai. I was gripped by an archival impulse. I was younger, as well as interviews, I set up a blog, Irani Chai Mumbai. This was right on the cusp of Web 2.0. Blogs were new. I was enthused by the promise online platforms offered in ways we could engage with history. I'll be honest, I met people in Mumbai who thought it was trivial. It didn't fit into their sense of what history was or what heritage work should be. Yet I met many more who were enthusiastic and wanted to share their memories with me. In India at this time, the use of oral history with non-elites was only just started to be considered a legitimate research method by the academy. In fact, it was several more years before it was taught on any serious level down at Tristi Institute in, in Bangalore with uh, Indira Chowdhury. Mira Manolan and Nira Artica's work on the mills was a groundbreaker. And this was published around the time that I started doing the interviews in cafes. I think probably in the last six or so years in Mumbai, we witnessed the power of social media. It's shifted people's understandings of what history and heritage can be. And the interest around the cafes and what they have come to represent is an example of that. We now see, of course, pre-COVID, heritage tours and walks that took it all, all that look at all sorts of elements of the city. Members of the HAI, the Oral History Association of India, are involved in projects everywhere. It is a completely different setting to when I sat, sat down in the cafes with my recorder. I'd say that the cafes with the seafront, the picture theatre, and the suburban rail car stand as really great secular sites of social memory in Mumbai's urban landscape. What they do is allow us to access the memory archives of the many, and they challenge our understanding of what history and heritage can be and how we can use it. I'll just finish off with a little bit about the blog. It's now entering sort of mid-adolescence, and it's changing its look somewhat, and we're adding a lot more material over the next couple of months that I've uh, had for some time and haven't been able to, to add on a new platform. Of course, contributions are always welcome, so take a look. And I'll finish with a quote from the late Baron Contractor, aka Busy Bee, one of the first to celebrate the delights of the Bombay Irani Cafe. In 1980, Baron said, it is difficult to imagine Bombay without its Iranis. It would be like New York without the Statue of Liberty, Paris without the Eiffel Tower, or Delhi without Old Delhi, or Calcutta without whatever it is supposed to have. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. That was a great presentation. Before I sort of go on to the other panelists, there's just one thing I wanted to ask. You have been returning to uh, Bombay in the 21st century. And I mean, uh, you have seen the cafes really reduce in numbers. 
Today, as you mentioned, there are barely maybe 35 left in all of uh, Mumbai. So do you think there's some spirit of the city that's gone that you had experienced earlier when you started your research and today? Are you able to make that sort of comparison? Or do you think it's been replaced by something else that doubles up as a cosmopolitan and uh, cosmopolitan spa is a space where everyone can meet? Do you think that we can ever get Simple. back to yeah, the yeah. Irani I Cafe? Mean, I guess the uh, online platforms are a cosmopolitan space um, where anybody can meet. Um, all you need is a, is a, a mobile phone. Uh, but... Uh, Boundaries obviously are much harder, much coarser than what they were, uh, but they're already on the way there anyway by the time I kind of started doing this work. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, it's the, the, the stuff in the, in the media has been going on for a couple of decades now. I've got, I've got reams of, of uh, newspaper articles, mm -hmm. the demise of the Irani, except that now we really are down to seriously small numbers. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask my next question to Mawash, who actually comes from the Irani, uh, uh, Irani Cafe community. Uh, now, Mawash, uh, could you tell us your, a little bit about how your parents came here and how your dad started his little tea shop? You, you described it as a tea shop and not as a cafe. Is that a spurious distinction or is it one and the same thing that you're talking about? So from, before I answer you, I'd like to say a very thank you to Avid and the Gateway House for putting this panel together. And it's given me a really an opportunity to go back through my childhood. So it's been enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, my father had a, I would say a small cafe, which is not a cafe at that time. It was like a tea shop, as Bruce beautifully said it. Mm -hmm. It had those round tables with those lovely chairs. Mm -hmm. which was very welcoming for everybody to come. And uh, yes, my father came here during the British time, mm -hmm. which usually most of the Iranian youths and youngsters used to come to Bombay. Right. That's how my father came. And we have that little uh, tea shop or a restaurant. It was not a restaurant. It was a tea shop. Okay. And it was around at uh, Baikala, mm -hmm. which was called... Uh, evergreen restaurant and uh, I believe I mean when, during our conversations prior to this event you did mention that your mother came a little later with the children and what were the challenges I mean coming from uh, a little town in Yaz what were the challenges she faced sort of when coming to a big city and a port city like Mumbai Yes, as usual, all the men, or rather the young men from Iran used to come here, gradually pave their way, get a little bit of, you know, finding their way, their roots, establishing themselves, and then they would get their family. And it was then that my, my mom, with my elder sister, Feroza, and myself, we came to Bombay by ship. Okay. And that was through Bandar Abbas. Okay. And uh, my daddy was here, so he knew more about the way, but we were somewhere around Fort area. Okay. And in that area, there were a lot of the Iranian women who mm. more or less were related because of the villages that they come through. Okay. Some were from Yaz, some were from Asrabad, some were from Alabad, some were from Kermanshah. So these where they knew each other. Mm. So that was gradually when, as the Iranian women were very strong, she picked up her ways around. One last question before I go to Iqbal is, uh, what about the Baha'i ecosystem, institutional ecosystem here? Because you all belong to the, yes, the Baha'i community. Uh, so can you just give us just a sh little short insight into what was, because the institutions were already in place here in Mumbai, and Mumbai had the first local assembly of the Baha'i. So do you have any recollections of that as a small child? Yes. Uh, frankly, my mother was a Zoroastrian. My father was a Baha'i. Mm -hmm. So we were more or less uh, uh, trained into the Baha'i gatherings. And we have the local spiritual assembly who mm -hmm. took care of the 
Baha'is and of course the various activities and so on and so forth. So we had the first local assembly who was very much instrumental in helping the Baha'is who came from out in gradually settling down also with their community activities and so on. Thank you, Mawash. Uh, I'm going to ask Iqbal the next question. Iqbal, your family history is very different from the Irani cafe owners and your the Irani merchants came to Mumbai really early. I mean, early 19th century were the earliest settlements here. So can you tell me a little about your family legacy in the city, how they came here, what they did, how did they settle down? Thank you for having me on this show. I reflect the sentiments of Mrs. Rohani. My great-grandfather came in to Bombay from Boucher. It must have been the 1850s or 1860s. And he came in as a businessman, as a trader. And as Mrs. Rohani said, the, the men came first, they established themselves, they, they figured out the law of the land, and then the families followed later on. Okay. So my uh, great-grandfather came in first and he came in for trade in as much as imports of dates, dry fruits, and carpets, as, as mentioned uh, earlier. So they brought all this. It was uh, Trade was brought into Bombay as it is now out of Bombay. So the Iranis used to come in here. They settled themselves here. Then the families came in. So he came in as a trader, established himself, and over a period of time, he was the founding member of Mogul Lines, which was a shipping company that was set up in, uh, in Bombay. Iqbal, it's interesting that you mentioned Mogul Lines because uh, Mogul Lines was the Hajj shipping company, as it were. It used to, a lot of the Iranians used to come here to Mumbai and then take the ship to Jeddah. Is that right? Well, I don't have those details, so I okay, okay. Anyway, anyway, but, anyway. Uh, yeah. What I wanted to really ask you is that where were the Iranian merchant community really settled in our city in Bombay at that time in the nineteenth century? See, when they came in uh, at that time, the concentration of the Iranians was uh, near Dongri, okay. better known as Umar Khadi. Uh, that was the area that they came in. Hmm. They had a support system there because there was a large uh, Iranian community there. Okay. And even when you did come in from there, uh, that area has a lot of Musafir Khanas. Okay. You know, when people used to come in, they had places to stay hmm. that were not very expensive, but right. were comfortable. Okay. So that's where they came in from. And uh, even if, uh, the, the Irani mosque, hmm is also in that area. It's in the Umar Khadi uh, uh, area. The, the Iranian school right. was also Anjuman Imam, uh, Amin Imam Bara, that is also, which uh, doubled up as a school right. uh, in, the, in the daytime. And the uh, religious functions took place after the school hours. It was all in that area. And that's where it, it expanded from. These what pictures you see at this point of time are pictures of the Iranian mosque, done typically uh, in the way of uh, uh, how a mosque would be in Iran itself, with the Firozi stones and the ornate designs and, and things like that. How does it differ? I mean, Iqbal, would you be able to tell our audience just generally, not in great detail, is how does an Irani mosque really differ from architecturally to any other mosque that you would see in that, re in that area? Irani mosque would usually have a lot of Firozi stone, the blue stone that you see. Right. And, and it is very ornate. It's, it's, the design is very ornate. It's very uh, uh, deep. It's very specific uh, kind of a design. It, it kind of stands out. It's got a dome, which is also ornate. Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, Aisha could just step back to that last slide, most of the entrances would be the way she has depicted in that photograph. Most of the entrances would be like this. Of course, the, the domes would be higher and larger. Hmm. But essentially, they all look like this, similar. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Iqbal, I mean, just talking, coming to the Irani mosque, 
what would you know why it's called Mughal Masjid? Because you know, when I went there, I mean, one of the reasons everyone refers to it as Mughal Masjid, but of course, the Irani Shia community says no, it's known as the Irani Masjid. Would you know the reason why it's uh, been uh, it's popular as a Mughal Masjid? Well, it is the Irani Masjid, but I'm I'm assuming that, you know, people would, would refer to it as the Mughal Masjid because they probably refer to it as the Mughals. Mm-hmm. Or because also uh, another reason could be that my great-grandfather was very instrumental in putting this together and, and repairing it and keeping it uh, keep, uh, and the upkeep. Right. And also having said that he had Mughal lines, so it was just probably a reference between the two, between Mughal lines and, you know, uh, Mughal Masjid. Right. But I cannot, I mean, I cannot say that's authentic. That's just a reference. One of the explanations that was given to me and which I'd like to share is that because uh, Persian was spoken in the Mughal courts is one of the reasons why that it was called as a Mughal masjid. But that may also, that's just something that's talked about. There's, there may be no historical basis for that. So, yeah. So uh, coming back to uh, what Mawash is saying, I'd like to sort of get into what uh, is the common cultural legacies of all the communities to Mumbai. So what I'd like to talk about is that are there certain common festivals that you're all, uh, and I'm going to go between Mawash and Iqbal this time, that all Iranis celebrate across the board? Is there a common cuisine that you'll share? Is there a common uh, language that you'll speak? Or does the dialect differ from the port cities and from South and Central Iran? Mawash, would you like to go there? Would you like to take that first? Yeah, I'd like to. Are you um, are asking with regards to the uh, festivals mm-hmm. and celebrations? Yes. One in common is the Nowruz. Right. Which is celebrated throughout Iran, no matter from what background or what religion. Or what, because it's a spring equinox. Right. And uh, it's celebrated also specially because on the 21st of March, 1844, mm-hmm. was the Baha'i dispensation which started Baha'i history. So for the Baha'is, we have a special program on that day, which is more with also devotional and spiritual and going through a little of the history. But otherwise, it's celebrated throughout wherever there are Iranians. And there is a beautiful relationship and culture, binding the culture on occasions, no matter from what background we come, but it's beautiful. The way cuisine you say, well, the Iranians more or less are non-veg and rich cuisine, I would say, with rice, with everything that they have, and a lot of green leafy vegetables. And uh, we call the Irani, we may call it Irani soup, which we call osh, Mm -hmm. which is, I'm sure, most of the Iranians from whichever part of Iran they come, they have it. And it's prepared in different ways. But osh is something which contains a lot of grains and a lot of green vegetables. And it's either sweet or sour with something like noodles into it. So it's got a different variety. But these are some of the common cuisine if you look at it. Then of course, most of the Iranians are aware of the the, um, the pipula, which we call it um, fesenjun. Mm-hmm. And orme sabzi, which is again full of green ferns, which red beans, and of course it has chicken. Mm-hmm. Or, and they add in it for sourness, it's called limu omani. It's okay. a dry lemon, which only the Iranians use it in the cuisine. So these are some of it which I could share. I'm sure Iqbal could share mm-hmm. more to it. Mamash, tell me the, uh, the line that you're talking about. Is it the black line? Is it a little different from the kind of line that we get here? I've not seen that line here, but it's black, it's okay. dried, and okay. we found it, and mm-hmm. we use it in our choresh, as you call it, in our food, yes. Okay. And mostly we get it from Iran. Mm-hmm. I've not seen it, but now it's available in the market. Okay. From Iran, yes. Iqbal, would you like to add to that from your community? 
But there's the the cuisine is reasonably similar. I mean, yes, mm-hmm. Nimu Amani, as uh, Mrs. Rohani has mentioned, uh, she's mentioned most of the dishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the Fesen Jun is what she she mentioned that that dish is made with a lot of pomegranate and walnut. Okay. So I mean, going down the route of uh, of the meals and the cuisine, mm-hmm. it's made with a lot of pomegranate, a lot of walnut, and it could be chicken, it could be a vegetarian dish, but keeping in mind that, that the Iranis will always have their meat with a vegetable. Okay. You will not have meat per se uh, besides a, a cello kebab. Okay. They'll have meat with a vegetable. For example, you could have bindi gosh, mm. meat and bindi, mm. or uh, dudi gosh, right. which is dudi and, and meat all together. Mm. Ash, is supposed is one of the finest dishes that I, I must have eaten from from Iran. It's got a little bit of everything, okay. and made naturally. Hmm. And all this, sorry, and yeah, all no, this is uh, is either is either washed down with tea, okay, or there is tea prior to the meal, okay. So uh, the Iranian hospitality is once you enter the house, hmm. you're given tea. You sit down and get mid-conversation, you're given tea. Then they announce the meal is going to be served, you're given tea. Before the meal, you're given tea. After the meal, it has to be washed down with tea. So you're a legendary for your hospitality. And Bruce, have you experienced that as in you know, as a researcher when you sort of visited Iranian homes, Ira- Irani homes here in Mumbai? And when you visited Iran itself, have absolutely. you eaten all this splendid food? And absolutely, absolutely. I, mean, I, I absolutely love Persian food. And just hearing you know, people mention gourmet subsi and peasant john and that sort of thing right now, I, mm-hmm. my mouth is kind of watering, you know, <laughs> even though it's like midnight here. But, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I partook of all of that um, mm-hmm. in Iran and uh, when I stayed with, some Irani families here in uh, there in uh, in Mumbai. Mm. Yeah, and I agree with Iqbal about the tea. There's always plenty of tea. Yeah, <laughs> but is it is it the Irani chai that you get in the cafe, or is it the black the red tea? The Irani. Mrs. Rohani, Mrs. Rohani can show you the cup of tea that she's having at this point of time. It's just brewed tea. It's not. It's not tea with milk. Okay, it's only brewed. It's not even boiled. It's okay. not even boiled. You boil the water, then you drop the leaves in. And okay. it's usually you have a samovar hmm. where the tea kettle is put on the samovar and there is water boiling. Okay. A little of the tea in the glass hmm. and then you open the tap and pour the water. So okay. that you have the tea. Okay. It is sometimes and, there, there are... and sometimes cinnamon is added to it. Okay. There are also times when the Iranis don't actually put the sugar in the tea. Hmm. Traditionally, they'll take a piece of sugar, which they call kand. Hmm. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a form of sugar. And they put it in their mouth and they sip the tea. Hmm. So the sugar is actually dissolving. Uh, I'm sorry, the tea is dissolving the sugar and it's going down. That's how it gets sweet. They don't drop the sugar in the tea. Okay. But tell me, uh, uh, Mawash and, and Bruce, in fact, this question is for both of you all, is how did the Irani chai come about with the brun pav and the curry biscuits and the brun maska in the Irani cafes? Mawash, would you like to go first? Because the, the chai we have here, the Irani chai is the milky tea. Yeah. I mean, you do get the brew tea too. But yes. largely what is popular amongst the locals is the milky tea with the brun pav or the ban maska or the curry biscuit. So can you tell us a little about that? How did they, how did your, how did your father and your ancestors here, how did the community cotton in on this as a bestseller? Yeah, I think the most of these tea shops, they started tea with milk. It was not this brewed tea. Mm-hmm. Because this was not a taste which the Indians would love to initially. Mm-hmm. It was mostly they started with this tea and there was something very special about it. Okay. They used to tell us they used to put glucose biscuit in the tea mm-hmm. to make that tea strong. 
And of course, the brun and the muska mm. is because the Iranians also had their bakery, which mm. they were very good in making the brun bread, which only the Iranians make this brun powder. Even today, mm. you'll find City Bakery and of course the others are picked up. Hmm. But these are the bakeries where they started this brun pound and bun pound, which is usually with muska, as we say, with butter. So hmm. these are some of the tradition in which the Iranians brought it into the tea shop. Hmm. Because even the Iranis, when we have this black tea, we have it with either dates. Hmm. As uh, Irbal beautifully said, we don't put sugar and stir the sugar. Right. Hand in our mouth hmm. and we drink the tea. So if we have dates, we have it with dates. So this was the Irani tea, but the Irani chai, mm -hmm. which they served and became very popular, which today, even the restaurants, mm -hmm. some of them are still serving. So this was a creation of... Bruce, would you like to add a little about the history of this uh, Irani chai and the snacks, the breakfast items that were served in the uh, cafe? Well well, what I would say is just that, you know, obviously that the Iranis were, you know, they were deft uh, business operators and they, they knew their market and they knew to sell. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, sweet milky tea and mm -hmm. made it available. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me, though, of an interview I did with Afl the late Aflatoon from Kiani, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about uh, poppy, couscous. Okay at one stage mm. tea and a lot was very popular with the the uh, night shift cab drivers oh, but okay. the BMC put a stop to it um, the way he told the story was really quite funny mm. um, as for the other uh, like like uh, Mavash was saying I mean people started got into baking um, biscuits and all that sort of thing mm. and of course kind of stuff that kind mm. of like cake and and, and curry biscuits and that sort of thing. Also was kind of, you know, uh, probably fit the tastes of, of, of sort of Anglos and Parsis as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it was not, uh, uh, it was a very, sort of a very agreeable type of, of, of snack mm -hmm. um, that, you know, people of any, it wasn't particularly strong taste or, um, anything like that or spicy or anything like that, of course. Um, so it reached a broad like is the fact that the Iranis in different areas would, uh, you know, like I said, really, really look after their clientele. So in, in, in uh, Christian areas, uh, they would bake Christmas cakes and sell okay. Christmas cakes. They would make uh, bake uh, Jane cakes, mm -hmm. the Jane community and that sort of thing. Um, just people that were really good at... At, at looking after their customer base, I think, which what I think a, is, yeah. is a great gift. Uh, 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 Bruce, is the, is the brun maska and the pau and the curry biscuits and the nankatais and everything, all the yummy biscuits and cakes, the mama cakes, is this, in, uh, is this basically uh, something the Iranians picked up here in Mumbai? from maybe the Goans or other communities, or is this something that they brought with them to Mumbai? I can't answer that. I, my sense is that they, there may be someone in the audience that could answer that if, mm -hmm. if Paolo or Mavash can't. Um, mm -hmm. A sense that it's something that, that, that started here. Okay. okay. Yeah. Iqbal, can you tell us a little about the typically Iranian flatbread bread that you get in some of the bakeries still? here in Mumbai? It's, it's like a pow, but it's flat. It's about five or six inches in, uh, uh, in diameter. Mm. And it's got sesame seeds on there. Okay. So this, was, this is actually a, a bread that is baked very, very typically in, in, for the Iranians. It's flat. It's not bulky like a brun pow. Mm. It's a flat bread, and this is had with a gravy dish. Okay. This is the uh, this is the actual uh, use for them. They have it with a gravy dish, and there is no distinction in the Iranian food where you do not have bread with rice. Okay. 
they would probably have bread and rice. It's, it's you know, here it is, uh, it's, you don't mix the two. You either have bread or you have rice. But they have no problem. They would have bread and rice. I've seen my father do it. Okay. You know, the first time it happened, I've seen my grandfather do it. Mm. And I was a little shocked. And then I realized that this is, that they have it this way. This is what, this is their meal. Mm. And coming back to the tea, if I may take you back a step, is uh, one, of the be- one of the ways of having tea is to take saffron. Put some sugar on it or can and mm. crush it mm. and pour hot tea in it on, the, on, the, on that sugar with saffron. And that adds an, an outstanding flavor to the tea. So, I mean, if your hosts really like you, they'll give you that tea. <laughs> now, coming back to more food and more food, I think that is what everyone wants to hear about is about the Irani Cafe. Mavash, what was the work-life balance I mean, the family and work balance in your home, considering, as Bruce mentioned in his presentation, that these Irani cafes actually came to service a certain market. They grew along with the mill industries, the docks. It was a sort of, uh, it was a cosmopolitan space where everyone could come. Blue collar workers, office workers, families, special family places, and how did they run their cafes from, say, 5 in the morning to 11.30, 12 at night and start as fresh the next day? How did it work that way? And what were the dishes that were served for lunch and for dinner that they were well known for? Well, the cafes initially when they came, they started, as I said, they started getting a foundation. And gradually they invited their cousins, their brothers and friends from back from Iran to come and join them. And it so happened that gradually whatever tea shop or businesses or bakery they had, they would have a few number of partners. Another mm-hmm. partners can be Zoroastrians, could be Baha'is, but there was a beautiful bond of trust. Mm-hmm. And that's how they gradually ran the business. Mm-hmm. And again, you ask the kind of food they served, as usually, it, if they had a tea shop, it was tea with brun pan, maska, ban pan, maska. And gradually, they introduced kima pan. Right. And these were the rest, uh, little tea shops. But you found the other places where they really served that Irani food, which had trotters and, you know, those other kind of food, which was, uh, they would go early morning and have it. So that was a different kind of food. But hmm. what these that they gradually introduced was a kima pan. Oh. Not aware more if Iqbal would be able to share more on that. Kima pan was usually considered a breakfast meal because uh, that's what it, it was with. Um, a lot of the places had, as uh, Mrs. Rohani mentioned, trotters. Hmm. They also... Uh, Gorda, kidneys, mm-hmm. and you know, very heavy food. Now, this eventually went out and became a full fledged restaurant, for example, where you had very pulao, very pulao being again a very authentic Irani dish where you only get the berries which are, uh, which are better known as zeresh mm-hmm. from Iran. You don't get them anywhere else. So, very pulao, the, the berries in that pulao is zeresh. That kind of food, uh, rice is, is, is a big, big thing with the Iranians, in, in, as Mrs. Rohani mentioned initially. Mm. So there was, a, there was a thing called Shevet Pula, made out of dill, dill leaves, right. that turns the rice green. And the first time it was served to any of my friends by my mother, they were taken aback because they never had green rice. They thought it was three days old. And I never heard the end of that one. Now, before I sort of go to the audience Q&A, and we've got quite a lot of interesting questions from there, uh, Bruce, I'd like you to actually talk a little about the Irani cafes. How were they really designed? I mean, uh, you know, uh, basically, I mean, most of them were corner properties, which were considered inauspicious by Hindus. And most of the Iranis shops even today although they're no longer there you know an irani shop by the corner property so even if it has become a thali place or a posh restaurant you probably realize that there was probably an irani shop there what about the decor what about the bentwood furniture and the tiling and the mirrors 
and the gala. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, look, I, I don't know great details on that, how that actually came to be in, in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very much a modern kind of a look, like a, a, and it was seen in other places as well to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, you know, it's very much a kind of Art Nouveau type modern uh, streamlined kind of look. Um, yeah, as I said, the, the, the wood people used to say was often teak from Burma. Mm -hmm. As people used to say, were either from Poland or Czechoslovakia. Um, but I don't know for certain. Okay. I'm going to actually open out to questions now because there have been a lot of interesting questions come in. So, and a lot of it is what I actually wanted to ask you. So rather than repeating it or not asking the questions is that firstly, the first question is actually for Bruce. Is Bruce, how did you decide to start your blog, Irani Chai Mumbai? What inspired you to do so? And why do you continue to do so? Okay. So what inspired me was that I was really shocked that there was nothing. Like I just expected that people, you know, friends when I was here told me about these cafes and I started going to them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, what's written about this? There must be stuff written about this. And there was nothing. Mm -hmm. It was at the time of, as I said, of, of what we call Web 2.0, so the beginning of the sort of social media type platforms and, and, the, and websites and the internet and that sort of thing. And I just, it just happened. I just thought, hey, I could just put this, this stuff up on, on the internet and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the response was incredible, you know, in those early years, the response was huge because people hadn't seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, they were like, you know, very surprised and, and quite delighted. And people, a lot of people, people contacted me from all over the world mm -hmm. with stories about their connections to the, the Irani cafes. Um, I haven't really actively uh, in the last few years uh, kept the blog up, but as I said in my presentation, I have uh, just moved it over to a new platform and I'll be populating that and that can sit there and it can be a resource for people to, um, you know, use when they, when they, when they wish. Okay, that takes me to my next question, actually, which is related to you, Bruce, to what you've just said, Bruce. You mentioned that it can be a resource and it's going to be an archive. And in fact, one of our audiences asked is, why are the historical Irani Chai cafes disappearing today? This question is from Mawash. Are younger generations keen on preserving this rich cultural heritage? Mavash, what is the reason why the youngsters aren't really going into running these cafes? Well, you know, as time went on, the, I, what I understand is from my own children and us, you know, their lifestyle was very difficult for the children mm -hmm. to have that family bond. And as they were educated, they found there were much more opportunities for them rather than running the businesses that the parents were running. And there was a little bit of, I would think, the elderly wanted to run it their way, which they have worked at it. So, you know, with all their efforts and everything, mm -hmm. and the youngsters found it very difficult to follow. This is one mm -hmm. of the reasons. Mm -hmm. But as they were educated, they all wanted to go out. Like my husband, I know, my children were all educated. Mm -hmm. And so none of them wanted to take over the family business. So this is one of some of the thoughts I can share. In fact, Mavash, talking about the family business, you haven't said anything about Davar and company. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, yeah, because the juice houses too, like for example, Bacha, which was uh, established in 1905. And you mentioned to me that Davar's was uh, established 70 years ago. Why is it that the Iranis went into making juices. I mean, most of these juices are manufactured by all year. So can you tell us a little about Davar and company? Well, as what I, I knew from history, that originally it was started by, again, a few of the Iranians who came mm -hmm. from Iran. Mm -hmm. And as we all mentioned, they were very fruit eaters and all the berries and the fruits. And mm -hmm. that is what they used to do even as occupation. 
Mm-hmm. So in a way that when they came here, they started this fruit juice, which was again on one of the corners. Mm-hmm. And here, then they gradually got in other partners. Some were Baha'is and some were Zoroastrians. Right. And they started with the juices of different berries, mm-hmm. you know, pomegranates. So these right. were the kind of juices. And it still continues today, though we don't have those berries, which we used to have those times. Mm-hmm. But Dabar and Company is still going on because of the name. Hmm. Because we were able to maintain a certain standard, and the second Jabin Sharbat, of course, hmm. it's very, very, very famous, hmm. which is a authentic Iranian drink which was brought to India. Hmm. It is very cooling. It is very good for digestion, and it's helped a lot to the people here. So Davar and Company has been going on for around over seventy-five years now. Hmm. And it's still going strong, but we have come to the end of it anyway, because none of the children want to carry it forward. Okay. And you'll manufacture these juices yourself? They're yes. manufactured by you all? Yes. We, it's, it's a company, by the family company, of course, and it's all by us, yes. Though we have partners of Zoroastrian and Baha'is. Right. But, yes. There's a question that's come in for Iqbal, actually. Uh, someone has asked is. Are ladies permitted into the Irani Masjid in Umar Khadi? And where exactly is Umar Khadi in Bombay? Uh, let me answer that question first. Uh, ladies have a section of, for themselves. There mm-hmm. is a zanana in that mosque. So they don't come in with the, uh, where, the, where the men are. Mm-hmm. There is a separate section for ladies. Uh, anywhere, as you would know, there would be a zanana and a mardana. So mm-hmm. the ladies are not permitted into the main section. They have a separate section for themselves, which is uh, cut off from, uh, from the main section. Mm-hmm. Uh, Umar Khadi uh, is very close to JJ Hospital. Mm-hmm. When you go down JJ Hospital, there is a lane exactly opposite JJ Hospital, the main entrance of JJ Hospital. I'm sorry, the side entrance of JJ Hospital. And you go down to the end of that lane and you just cannot miss it the Irani Masjid's diagonally to your right. Uh, when you finish, when you come to the end of that lane, you have the original Irani Hammam mm. facing you when you hit that lane. If I'm not mistaken, Iqbal, I think it's gate number eight of JJ Hospital that you have to walk the lane opposite gate number eight to come to the Correct. Irani Mosque. Yeah. You're right. There. You're yeah. right. And the, at the end of the lane, you'll have uh, you'll have uh, the Irani Mosque and the Hammam right there. Another thing, another question that's come in, now I don't know who will be able to take this, is that if it were not for the Irani community in the city, what would we be missing in Bombay today if the Irani legacy was not there? Who would like to take that? Well, if I may, Mrs. Rani? (laughs) I think what they will be missing is, though, though it's... Uh, evolved, but they were missing the lovely welcoming and the hospitality of the Iranian owners in the tea shops. I can say that much (laughs) because they were really warm, they were welcoming and they were very, very friendly. Mm -hmm. So this is what I can say they will be missing in Bombay. Well, I reflect on the thought of the hospitality because the Iranians, and I think Bruce has also touched upon the topic that the Iranian hospitality is is something to to be proud about. And I can see, I can tell you from from uh, my family and how how my mother was with the hospitality when people came over. It was overboard. We've all picked up from there. And the other thing that you would miss out on is, I would say, the Irani food. Mm. You know, the, the bakeries that you have today are by and large run by most of the Zoroastrian, Baha'i or, or the uh, Shia Iranis. Hmm. Uh, city bakery being one. Uh, hmm. There's one at uh, Honeman Circle, uh, Yazdani. Right. Uh, then you also have uh, the Sasanian, Kayanis, all these places hmm. that actually give you the Irani, whether Zoroastrian or what, the Irani food. Hmm. By and large. Even Paris Bakery is Irani? I'm not aware of that. Yeah, okay. I cannot say. I'm not aware of that. What about the names of the Irani cafes? That's another interesting aspect. I mean, they took these names from, you know, they had these unusual names. They were either Persian names 
or they had taken the names of British royalty for which they had to take special permission for. How did, these, how did they draw on these names? Mrs. Rohani, can you enlighten us on that? Would you be aware of that? Yeah, mostly they took it because they were there during the British time. Lucky Moon Restaurant, Ever Moon mm. Restaurant, Parks mm. Restaurant, Edward Bakery, New Ideal Restaurant. Mm. So these were some, they took it because it was during the British time. Mm. Most of these were taken from that context. This is what I understand. Maybe it will be similar. Uh, Bruce, can you, uh, would you be able to enlighten us a bit more on that? Uh well, as I said, I think that uh, it, it fit very comfortably into the British colonial project to mm. have those kind of names. Um, mm. You know, it, they didn't ruffle any feathers. They mm. just with being good business people and, 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 and running their businesses. Mm. Um, yeah, quite smart thinking, really, quite, you know, uh, yeah, good business people. There's another question that's come in that besides the Irani cafes that we are just talking about the Yazdis, that means the Zoroastrian, the Shia and the Baha'i, did they do any other kind of work? Are they, did they enter into any other kind of profession or were, were they largely into the cafe business and did they recruit people from their own community into the cafe business? Uh, Mrs. Rouhani, would you be able to enlighten us on this? Well, they did recruit people into their business mm. because as their business grew and flourished, they needed more helping hands. Mm. And it was not only from their own community, mm. but they welcomed whoever they felt would be a helping hand. And mm. yes, besides the tea shops, they had bakeries mm. and of course the fruit juices. Mm. And I'm not aware of more than this, but I think this was what the Iranians set up initially. There's another question that's come in is about the ice cream sandwich. Someone has said that the, can you tell us a little more about the Irani ice cream sandwich? Are you, yeah. Bruce, uh, Mrs. Rouhani? I know that it was very famous. Mm. It's a church gate. Mm. And as children, we also loved it. And it was run, of course, by the Zoroastrians. Not uh, the Irani Zoroastrians or the Parsis? I am not too sure. Okay, okay, okay. I think there's references actually to K. Rustam and company. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a question coming for uh, both Iqbal and Mrs. Rouhani. What is the population of your communities in the city today? The Shia Iranis would be anywhere between eight to nine thousand, okay. uh, approximately. Hmm. Uh, that's them. I cannot. Uh, I cannot speak for the Baha'is, but the Shia Iranis would be about eight to nine thousand. Uh, Mawash, what about your community in? Uh... Yeah, I would like to say about the Baha'i community. We are around five hundred in Bombay. Though we are from all different backgrounds, it's not only Iranian. Mm -hmm. We have from all various backgrounds, but we have 500 as a Baha'i community in Bombay. The next uh, question, another thing that's come here is about the circulation of people between Bombay and Iran. Uh, do you all still get staff from Iran, from your villages and community? Do you all intermarry with the, with the family back home? What is the circulation? Do you visit home often? Does that kind of circulation still happen? Is it as active as it was in the early half of the 20th century? Iqbal, can you take that? Well, there is a lot of traffic between Iran and, and Bombay. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have family there in mm -hmm. Iran and they visit, we visit quite often. And of course, now since the last year or so, we've had no visitors. But there is a lot of interaction between them and us. We speak to them on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. We're still in touch with everybody. And yes, uh, besides for the ones that we know, there are many people who still come here for trade. Mm -hmm. There are uh, Iranians who still come here for uh, uh, stones. Mm -hmm. There are Iranians who still come here and, and do business here. Iran buys a lot of stuff from India, um, mm -hmm. namely fish. There's a, they have a huge canning uh, industry. Mm -hmm. 
and they need a lot of products. So they still buy a lot of tuna from India, besides for other fish as well. Mm -hmm. Since that's my line, I can elaborate on that. Okay. And they have a very well-known uh, uh, canning industry, mm -hmm. uh, which they send a lot of the uh, canned tuna to the Western countries. Uh, Iqbal, what about the traditional trade? I mean, uh, the dates, the dried fruits, the carpets, of course, horses, of course, are a thing of the past. But uh, what about the traditional fruits, saffron? Are they still sort of imported in quantity? There is, there is some movement of dried fruits and, uh, and saffron. Mm -hmm. Carpets, very limited because uh, I think we have a fantastic industry out here itself, mm -hmm. you know, with, mm -hmm. uh, with Kashmir and berries. And most of the carpets today are mechanized rather than hand woven. Mm -hmm. uh, Dry fruits, yes, there still is, uh, is business coming in. But uh, today, the majority of the dry fruits is uh, from the north of India. Mm -hmm. From, uh, from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, from that belt, from mm -hmm. Kashmir in mm -hmm. that area, Himachal mm -hmm. has a lot of very good dry fruit. So it's uh, price-wise, there's no comparison. So there's very, that, is, that has been limited and restricted to a great extent. Mm -hmm. But initially, when, it, uh, when the trade started between I Iran and, and India, mm -hmm. there was a lot of dry fruit. There even horses were being brought in from, uh, from Iran. Mm -hmm. A lot of carpets. A lot of dates, because dates is something that we have uh, an appetite for right. in India. Mm -hmm. And Iranian dates uh, were well known in the days gone by. But now, of course, you have Muscati and Saudi Arabian dates. That also. There's a question come in from Mudit Jain. He says, would Irani food in India be similar to the food in Iran? No? Okay. And is the hammam next to the mosque still live today? No. Okay. Uh, there's another question coming from Mira Shah, and she says, where, where can one get the Dava Sejubin syrup? Sekenjubin. Yes, yeah, Sekenjubin syrup. You can get it at Dava and Company, which is at Nal Bazaar. Right. Okay. Uh, there's a question that says, uh, someone's asked Mrs. Rouhani, it says that, as you said, the next gen isn't interested in running the business. Is it frowned upon in the community to seek outsiders to carry on the business? I have seen Cafe de la Pay, Pay, Pay has revamped the cafe, for instance. They've taken an outside partner. Yes, but here we do, I mean... We do not have the younger generation who wants to even take it and revamp it and start it. So it's very difficult for us to continue with it. So we are trying to think on what next project we can bring in. And yes, maybe mm -hmm. we can give it to some other outer resources. Uh, Dinesh Rana has asked, describe a quint quintessential Iranian in your eyes. Are Iranis stereotype like, say, the Parsis are? Do you see any difference in personality or character in the generations gone by and the ones to come? Three questions in one. Who is a quintessential Irani? Are they stereotype like the Parsis? Has the character changed down the generations? But I won't say that. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Mrs. Go, ahead. Sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Take it first, but we can come back to Mrs. Rohan. I do not think that you can say that they are stereotyped at all. No, mm -hmm. no, they are very. It's very different. Yes, the Iranians of the day uh, of the earlier days were uh, were a lot stricter and more disciplined. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot say that. Okay, he's an Iranian, so this is the kind of person he would be your character. No, I would not say that. This is I, I agree because everything has evolved. Personalities have evolved, characteristics have evolved, social relations have evolved. So you can't get characterized all the Iranis as some. No. Another question that's coming is what about the do the communities intermingle with each other, the Iranians, whether there's Rashtrian, Parsi, Baha'i, Shias? And do they have social relationships like marriage, attending each other's death ceremonies, religious festivals? Are there any ethnic affinities? 
Would anyone like to take that? What is the sort of uh, cultural interaction between the communities? I would say there's very little, to be honest with you, because mm. you know there's no there's no common platform here. Mm. There's no common platform uh, in, in uh, between the the Zoroastrians, the Baha'is, and the uh, and the Shia Iranis. Right. But yes, between the the Irani Shias mm. and the uh, the rest of the Muslims, yes, there is a sort of uh, interaction because we have many common festivals like Eid. Right. And we have uh, various other, uh, for example, a uh, death. Mm-hmm. You know, is not is is not specific to a specific uh, to a, to a, to a sect. Mm. But there's no common uh, uh, platform between the Zoroastrians, Baha'is, and the Irani Shias. Oh. And there's no there's no uh, interaction between us either. Uh, Mrs. Rohani, what about the interaction, say, between the older Parsi community and the Irani Zoroastrian, the later migrants? I think the interaction would be like how any normal relationship would be mm. as we know each other as friends or relatives and all that kind of interaction mm. this is how i would look at it it's a mingling of together as each one of us we we follow different laws maybe but we are all together so that bond of interaction is there with all of us it's not i mean we do not what to say differentiate each other mm. as human beings we are all together in that uh, Iqbal, uh, there's a question that's come in that is said is that uh, what has been the family tradition from Iran? That means your family is now in Bombay now for over 150 years. And do you all still practice such tradition if you all still carry on with it? Is there something from your homeland that you've brought here to Bombay? Well, there are various things that we still carry on with. For example, mm. for Novruz, 21st of March, mm. uh, we still, as a community, still have the Sufra. Mm. My sister still does it. Mm. For the community, she will lay out the Sufra where they have dry fruits, they have eggs, they have painted eggs, they have wheat grass that is that they that she grows for approximately 15 days or 20 days prior to the to the festival mm-hmm. and they lay out a sufra and in iran and many iranis in bombay still lay out the sufra mm-hmm. even when we get married mm-hmm. uh, there still is a traditional marriage which is the nikah mm-hmm. for the iranians is very different because the the sufra that is laid out the the uh, platform that is laid out for the couple there's a very traditional way of actually uh, rubbing sugar over the heads of the, the couple, the newlywed couple. Hmm. That is still being practiced here. I was married like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a question that's come in. Now, I really don't know how that fits in, but maybe Mrs. Rohani or Bruce could answer it. Some Iranis were in the business of owning single screen cinema halls. Now, I haven't come across that in my research, so I'm just wondering, is that true? Because I know the Parsi involvement in the Hindi film industry and in owning cinema halls, but what about the Irani Zoroastrian involvement? I'm I'm not aware of that. Uh, Bruce, are you aware of it? Uh, I've heard of uh, Iranis being involved in the, the, you know, the canteens, the the shops in the... uh, in the in the in the movie halls, mm-hmm. but the actual movie halls, though. Okay, but not as in owning cinema halls. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that. I've heard of Iranis running, you know, the the, the catering. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Mawash. It says that what language do the Iranis speak in, at home, and is it the same as the way the Parsi speak, say Gujarati at home? Is it the same language or uh, do you all speak something else at home? Okay. The Iranis who we come from Iran, from Yazd, and uh, mostly the Zoroastrians, we speak Dari at home. Okay. Today, but today, this Dari language is literally, because it's only a dialect. Mm-hmm. It's not written and read. It's only the Zoroastrians, the early Zoroastrians. So at home, we used to speak Dari. But okay. today, they speak Persian. Okay. So none of the younger generation will know Dari. Okay. 
because all now speak Persian because they feel it is a language which is now gradually lost. Mm -hmm. So they speak Persian. Uh, and uh, do you speak Dari, Mrs. Rohani? Yes, I do speak okay. Dari because with my parents, I've grown up Dari and we speak mm -hmm. Persian too because mm -hmm. of family and relatives coming in from Iran and going to Iran and all. So even we speak Persian. One question I personally want to ask is actually about the Iranian sweets. The gaz, I think Asad and I were literally sort of, you know, our mouths are watering over it. So can you tell us a little about the Iranian sweets? Were they served in the cafes? Do you all make it at home? Where can we get them in Mumbai? Well, I can speak about gaz, which it comes from Isfahan. And the earlier gaz was beautiful, round little gaz, which all the dry fruits, and it was put in full of flour. But yes. today, that gaz has also become different. Yes. Then we have the bogalava, yes. which is one of the most, what is it, delicate sweets, which is, yes, prepared at home. Yes. Then we have the son, pashmak, yes. then rotab. These are some of the sweets which, yes, we do prepare it, which I have not since a long time. Mm -hmm. But in Iran, yes, for occasions and festivals, mm -hmm. always we would prepare at home, yes. So these are some of the sweets, not forgetting the Shirazi Faluda, mm -hmm. which has come to India and it's become a different Faluda, but it's mm -hmm. got its taste, yes. And saffron, mm -hmm. which Iqbal earlier said, saffron is very much used by the Iranians, even in our food. Mm -hmm. You know, when they bring rice, there'll be plain white rice, but there'll be saffron rice also. So mm -hmm. saffron is another spice which is very much used by the Iranians, no matter from what background, but they use it. These are some of the sweets I can recall. Mawash, one last question, actually, before we wrap up. So I literally give you the last word is what's the difference between the Iranian fal faluda and the faluda that we have here in uh, Bombay? Okay, the Iranian faluda, we call it Shirazi faluda, which those uh, spaghetti, as you see, mm. was wheat soaked, ground, then the milk was dried, and out of that, they made the spaghetti, if you can call it. Today, mm. they make it out of arrowroot or corn flour. Okay. And that was the Shirazi faluda, which was iced with fragrance of rose, and a little lemon juice over it. So that was the original faluda, which we call it Shirazi faluda. And when it gradually came to Bombay, it gave it another beautiful shape with a little ice cream and the rose sarbat. It became enjoyable and everybody loves it. So that's the story of the faluda. <laughs> okay, I think we've had a fantastic session. Thank you all for being here today and spending time with us. And I hope our audience enjoyed the conversation on the Irani culture in Mumbai. And we've uncovered it enough for you all to explore it further. So I'd like to thank Avid, Iqbal, Mawash, and Bruce for joining us. Bruce, it's really late in Australia. So thank you for staying up. And I have, hope you've got That's a nightcap trouble. next to you. <laughs> yeah. I have. <laughs> you do. You do. <laughs> So I'm going to hand over to Asad to do the orders. Thank you so much, Sifra. And thank you to our wonderful speakers for sharing such insights into the Iranian community. You know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little amiffed, like we're doing this during lockdown where we all can't be together. Otherwise, I'm sure we'd be at Iqbal or Mrs. Ruwani's house having a post-discussion meal of berry pulao and our beloved Gaz. But I think a rain check is due for that uh, in, in due course. Um, no, thank you to our partners, uh, you know, the Gateway House uh, for making this event a success. Manjit Kriplani, Ali Asghar. And lastly, but not the least, a big thank you to you, Sifra, for moderating the session. I mean, you've been, you know, stellar and helpful and, and uh, really welcoming with all our demands. And please don't forget our next diaspora um, we're going to be examining is the Portuguese later in the year. Thank you to our participants for joining us. Um, we have many interesting programs uh, coming up. Our next session is on the is another series we have on cultural capitals, uh, looking at the future legacies of Indian cities. And we're going to be looking at Ahmedabad, 
on the 15th of July followed by a series on uh, on gender equality in film on the 22nd. To find out more, just uh, tune in to our uh, website or stalk us on social media. But until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much. And um, I think you've, you've all left us really hungry at this point of time. But thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.